Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is an honor and pleasure to moderate this virtual event today. I am Natalie Paholyotin, CEO of WF Thailand, and I will be your moderator for today. WWF is the world's largest conservation organization, and this month we celebrate our 60th anniversary. This year also marks 20 years of partnership between WWF and the Asia Development Bank. WWF believes that a healthy ocean is essential to keep our climate in balance, feed a growing population, support economic development, and protect habitats and wildlife. WWF works with partners around the world to protect our oceans and its biodiversity so that future generations can benefit from and continue to enjoy it. The ocean is also our planet's seventh largest economy with assets worth an estimated 24 trillion US dollars. And we believe that it must be a sustainable blue economy, one which people and communities are at the center. Thus, when WWF had this opportunity, we believe that a sustainable blue economy would be a highly relevant topic, given these challenging times when humanity is reconsidering our relationship with nature. WWF's guiding vision is that people and nature coexist in harmony. Moreover, this theme resonates well with ADB's Healthy Oceans Action Plan. This session will explore how to use COVID-19 recovery investments to ensure a more sustainable and resilient post-pandemic economy. The blue economy has been particularly hard hit by supply chain disruptions and tourism's collapse. Reshaping it to function sustainably can support livelihoods and a greener and more resilient future. Today, we are joined by a terrific panel of six, and I would like to introduce our first panelist, Vice President Ingrid Van Vies from the Asia Development Bank. Good afternoon, Ingrid. I invite you to make welcome remarks. Good afternoon, Natalie, and good day. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Asian Development Bank to today's panel. Across Asia and the Pacific, biodiversity and healthy marine ecosystems are critical to life, livelihoods and economic prosperity. They provide food, clean air, medicine and carbon storage along with many other ecosystem services that underpin various economic sectors, such as tourism, fisheries, and aquaculture. However, acceleration of diversity, biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation at an alarming rate is threatening the region's development gains, especially the health, livelihood, and resilience of our most vulnerable communities. To focus on supporting the transition and expansion of the region's blue economies in harmony with healthy marine ecosystems, we launched at our annual meeting in Fiji in 2019, a dedicated 5 billion US dollar action plan for healthy oceans and a sustainable blue economy. We aim to assist with the transition towards sustainable, growing and resilient blue economies and marine ecosystems that contribute to the region's inclusive and prosperous future. Shaping and building an inclusive post-COVID future that leaves no one behind, in harmony with our aquatic and terrestrial environments and aligned with nature's limitations and needs, will require the competence, expertise and ingenuity of all stakeholders, the government, the private sector, representatives for the environment, and civil society. The speed and depth of this transition will ultimately be defined by the quality of cooperation amongst all parties involved and required to conceive, implement, and finance this very transition. Much of our progress to date, such as regulation of plastic pollution, 
the launch of an ocean finance framework that defines our blue finance transactions and a multi-stakeholder fund providing flexible finance facilities is fueled by strong partnerships, such as that with the WWF. They based on mutual respect, trust and complementary capacities, such as strength in policy leadership, science-based solutions, blue finance and on the ground presence. As we enter the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development, we need to strengthen and expand our partnerships to benefit from our synergies and to seize opportunities to work more closely and more substantively on generating and sharing knowledge, piloting innovations, developing programs, and last but not least, co-investing. Today's panel couldn't be a more pertinent occasion to celebrate the 20th anniversary of ADB's partnership with the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, the WWF. In 2001, we agreed to develop a partnership to contribute towards the sustainable management of the natural resources on which we all depend. Our partnership anchored in a mutually shared goal to support countries and their private sectors to transition to environmentally sustainable development pathways is as relevant today as it was back in 2001. Our collaboration has had many successes, from our support in promoting nature-based solutions to climate change and collaboration on water stewardship. For many years, our organizations have been working hand-in-hand -hand on cutting-edge regional programs, such as, for example, the Coral Triangle Initiative, which covers coastal and marine resource management, related livelihoods, coral reefs and food security. Another example is the Core Environment Programme for the Greater Mekong sub-region. More recently, our partnership has been expanded to include the reduction of marine plastic pollution. Our partnership with WWF is a shining example of how collaboration can help realize the potential of a sustainable blue economy. To summarize and to conclude, only through good cooperation with partners, leveraging each other's strength, we can rise to the challenge to restore and preserve our natural capital and the invaluable services it provides for many generations to come. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the other panelists and like to hand back over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much, Ingrid. We will hear from you again during the panel and the Q&A and of course, during the concluding sessions. Thank you, Ingrid. We just heard from Ingrid as representative of ADB. Now I'd like to invite our second panelist, Vice President Christian Kettle Thompson from the European Investment Bank, and he's dialing in from Luxembourg. Hello, Christian. I'd like you to invite, I'd like to invite you to share about what the EIB ADB Clean and Sustainable Ocean Partnership that was announced in January. What are some of the key focus areas and maybe share what are some of the next steps likely to be? Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and, and good morning to you. Good morning to you all from Luxembourg. And thank you to Ingrid and, and, uh, and Natalie for the invitation to be with you today. And uh, may I just also congratulate the World Wildlife Fund on its 60th anniversary just last week. You've certainly come a long way in these 60 years. The agreement you mentioned is on clean and sustainable ocean partnership between the Asian Development Bank and the European Investment Bank was made last year, oh, in January this year. It reflects both our institutions' commitment to collaborate on the development of clean and healthy oceans. We will cooperate in all steps during the specific projects. 
that is on the identification of potential projects, preparation, co-financing and implementation. We have four main focus areas. The marine plastic reduction, blue bioeconomy activities with a focus on sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, coastal resilience and protection, and green shipping, ports, and associated maritime infrastructure. In Asia, we see a particular need to focus on projects that reduce the amount of waste and plastics discharged to rivers and oceans, in particular plastic waste. This reflects that five of the most plastic polluting countries in the world and eight of the 10 most plastic polluting rivers are located in Asia. But we also see an increased commitment in taking action to stop this from governments, local authorities, communities, and often encouraged to act by civil society organizations engaged in these questions. By 2030, the ocean economy could more than double its value added in economic terms. This is good, but without countermeasures, this will lead to increasing pressure on marine and coastal ecosystems, as well as intensified climate, climate-related risks. We should not let this happen. COVID-19 recovery and stimulus packages must be able to address immediate health, social and economic needs, but at the same time, they should be based on long-term planning that also takes into account the social and environmental sustainability. Let me give you some examples. Where relevant and possible, nature-based solutions that contribute to protect, sustainable manage and restore ecosystems would be a priority. Introduction of further development of urban greenery and wetlands will contribute to increased resilience, clean the air and regulate the temperature. Better waste collection, recycling of materials and bio-waste and upgrade of residual waste disposal can, in many places, improve the urban environment and public health and also reduce the climate impact and at the same time create new jobs. In coastal cities, it will also contribute to reducing the discharge of plastics to the oceans. A global challenge like this, like this one, requires a global effort. And I'm pleased to see that more than 50 institutions have now joined the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative, including the World Wildlife Fund, Asian Development Bank, and the European Investment Bank. The oceans are extremely important for the planet from both an economic and a climate point of view. And we must, we must preserve this fundamentally important asset for life on Earth. One way to do this could, for example, be that by channeling our investments for sustainable activities to the sectors that we have identified for cooperation together with the Asian Development Bank. Thank you very much, Natalie, and I look forward to also listen to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for sharing your remarks and all the information about the ocean partnerships. I'm sure we will hear from you again during the Q&A. So it is now time to introduce the rest of the panelists. Our panelists are leaders and specialists in fields ranging from nutrition, livelihoods, conservation, and protected area management. They work with local communities to build greater resilience through sustainable and inclusive approaches. And they are Ali Peretti Tawake, Chair, Locally Managed Marine Area Networks International, and he's based in Fiji. Dr. Shakuntala Thilstead, Global Lead, Nutrition and Public Health of World Fish. She's based in Penang, Malaysia. Rinda Melson, President, Musatuva Women Saving Club from the Solomon Islands, and Anna Oposa, Executive Director of Safe Philippine Seas, and she's based in Manila in the Philippines. Now this session will be divided into three main parts. In the first part, I will invite distinguished panelists to share their experiences and their work with local communities. In the second part, we will have a panel exchange among all the six panelists. Then the third part, is the Q&A where the audience can ask questions to all the speakers. 
We will end the event with concluding thoughts from Ingrid and from Christian, and we will watch two videos together. Before we begin, I hope that I can share a few house rules so that the session is most productive for all. One, some panelists are dialing in from a remote location. So if there are any technical difficulties, I hope that you will be patient with the technological constraints that may happen. Two, I have a disclaimer. I've never used this virtual meeting software, so I may too be a little bit slow. Um, so thanks for your understanding in advance. And three, lastly, as the moderator, I will have to intervene if anyone goes over time. Um, and I also take the opportunity to remind our speakers to, to kindly respect the allocated time. So thank you. And now let's dive into this exciting session together. Our first panelist joins us from Fiji. Ali Ferretti has led the creation of locally managed marine area networks. So Ali Ferretti, good evening. I'd like you to share with us about the locally managed marine area network, what achievements you are most proud of, and what have you seen in terms of disruptions um, that may have been caused by COVID-19 on, on communities and on the impacts of the natural resources there. Thank you. Bola Binaka and uh, greetings from uh, Suva in Fiji. Uh, I'm I'm uh, honored and very pleased to be able to represent the collective voice of the grassroots communities, who are the members or co-members of the LMMA network that I uh, lead as a co-council chair. Uh, may I join my other colleagues and uh, panelists in uh, congratulating WWF and uh, ADB for the partnership. Uh, as is, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, to be able to hear um, spanning 20 years. Um, the LMMA network, which is in short for locally managed marine area network is a homegrown initiative. Uh, it's comprising, com comprising of communities, practitioners and uh, government representatives who are uh, mainly on the ground um, uh, stakeholders uh, working with uh, with the communities in managing their uh, resources. It was formed in 2000 and operating as a as an informal network and later registered as a, a CSO in 2018. When I reflect on uh, what LMMA network has achieved, the following phrases. Uh, and highlights uh, our collective achievements. One is uh, networking or partnership. Two is uh, empowerment. And three is uh, community resilience. Now, uh, networking, obviously growing a network that is uh, multifaceted, uh, multi-levels that has uh, enduring, has endured um, uh, 20 years of changes is in itself uh, an achievement. Um, you know, growing from uh, communities to islands to provinces, nationally and also now beyond uh, the Pacific. So collaboration and working together has been one of our intentional approaches, uh, pioneering the ABCs of networking while growing a bottom-up uh, grassroots network. Um, doing that while uh, using mainly the trust as our social capital, uh, amongst other natural capitals and other capitals, um, and based on a trusting relationship and learning by doing. Uh, starting from a few communities in Indo-Pacific, the success of those uh, uh, stories spread uh, across uh, the Pacific. And in Fiji alone, uh, we now have uh, more than 470 communities that are part of the initiative. Um, maybe just to be aware as well, across the Pacific, there are more than uh, 10,000 uh, communities across the Pacific. So the LMMA network uh, now exists in Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, uh, Micronesia, Palau, Solomon Islands, uh, with uh, thousands of communities who are members. 
Uh, we firmly believe in uh, greater than the sum of our individual parts, that by networking, we can achieve a lot more for nature through a win-win solution. Secondly, it's about empowerment. Uh, empowerment is still a journey in progress, and uh, many of us uh, can point to at least some older uh, people uh, in the communities who have mentored us, who inspired us uh, to take uh, next steps towards uh, uh, empowerment. For uh, LMMA Network, uh, inspiring an army of community champions is uh, another uh, achievement. Uh, thirdly is uh, community resilience. Uh, LMMA is considered an, a nature-based solution with a primary objective of ensuring community resilience through uh, resilience of the food systems. Uh, for Fiji in particular, research indicates that household incomes have uh, increased by at least 30% as a result of LMAs in the first uh, uh, five years of establishment. Also improving livelihoods and increasing uh, catch and yield uh, and uh, essentially well-being of the people. So resilience of uh, food system is key to ensuring food security, especially through crises such as uh, COVID-19. So these results and stories uh, resonate across the Pacific and uh, is, uh, is, is instrumental in uh, the outreach and upscaling of the efforts uh, across the LMMA network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali Ferretti, for sharing your experience and your thoughts on building food resilience. We will hear from you again later. Now from Fiji, we jump to Penang, one of my favorite foodie cities in Southeast Asia. And very appropriately, we will now invite Dr. Shakuntala Filstead, who is an expert on nutrition and public health. Good afternoon, Dr. Shakuntala. There is a lot of talk about the impact of COVID-19 on seafood export supply chains, but coastal fisheries are also important for coastal communities. Can you share what you are seeing in terms of impact of COVID-19 on local communities from a public health and nutrition perspective? And maybe could you please talk about, you know, what types of policies uh, need to be in place to make it happen? Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and greetings all from Penang, Malaysia, where it's extremely hot right now. Um, so I'll focus on coastal population, coastal communities and public health and nutrition. And the first point I want to make is that we all know that if you look at data, that coastal populations belong to the most poor and vulnerable of national populations. And even though our data on coastal populations are not really very good, um, that's one thing I already now could say that we can have investments on. That's getting more information and more reliable data on coastal populations. We do know that a focus on coastal populations can raise um, countries in, uh, in being well nourished. So if we look at, let me begin by giving um, some figures about at the global level. If we look at the state of food security and nutrition in the world, we do know that the impacts on nutrition from COVID-19 is going to be really tough, has already been really tough in the 2030s. There are reports saying that up to 132 million people have become more people, have become more hungry alone in 2020. We know that the numbers of undernourished people are rising. We know that child wasting, that is children who are too to who weigh too little for their age is increasing. And we know that these diet changes in food and nutrition security are happening very much so in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. So we, and we also know that deaths in children is increasing. So, and having coastal populations and recognizing that they are the poor and vulnerable and they are had they are hit hard, then we know that coastal populations are suffering from these dire effects of COVID-19. We also know that coastal populations depend on aquatic foods, fish and other aquatic foods from the seas 
for their food and nutrition and for their livelihoods. And the data also tells us that that women are being hit hard in terms of accessing food, in, in terms of their livelihoods, and in terms of their income that has been reduced with the effects of coastal, with the, with the effect of COVID-19 on coastal populations. And we also know that this group is very, very vulnerable. We know that over 800 million people around the world depend on small-scale fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. And 90% of these come from low- and middle-income countries and small island states. So if we would want to to, to, if you would want to improve the situation with respect to COVID-19, when we are looking at the recovery stage, we very much have to focus on coastal populations. One point that I would like to make here is that we, we talk a lot about coastal populations. Um, and I'm, of course, this is important for small island states and, and, and important also in, in other countries and also high income countries. But if you would look at Asia, in many Asian and African countries, by far the largest source of production and consumption of fish and other aquatic animals stem from inland waters. So I would really like, that's the first point I want to make. When we are looking at recovery, when we are looking at investments and actions, let us please not only think about the coastal communities, but also inland communities that depend on inland waters. The second point I want to raise is about um, improving the procurement of nutritious foods and nutritious foods for groups like school children um, in mother and child health care and uh, and uh, and also for the public at large but if we would do this and look at the procurements for school children and for um, for mother and child health care programs for example then we could reach far in alleviating some of the efforts some of the some of the um, changes we are seeing that COVID-19 is having on, on very poor and vulnerable populations, such as coastal populations. So that's where I think we should put our, firstly, put our efforts in recovery with respect to the people for improving food and nutrition security. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakuntala. It's very interesting that you raised this point on nutrition. We normally, that's not the first thing we think of uh, when we think of COVID-19. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and it certainly has implications on inequities to local communities. We, get, we began in exploring impact at the local community level with Dr. Shakuntala. So let's continue with our next panelist, Rinda Melson in the Solomon Islands who will talk about local livelihoods and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Rinda, good afternoon. Can you explain how the Women's Savings Club works and what types of activities and businesses are supported? And over the past 12 months, have you noticed any changes in terms of local businesses and local communities in, in the way resources are used? Good evening to you all. Do you know uh, that about 75 of the Solomon Island populations are rural dwellers who primarily rely on their natural resources for their livelihoods? I'm Rinda Melson, a rural woman from Nusa Tuva community on Kolobangara Island in the western part of the Solomon Islands. Involving in a number of resource management related community project in the past several years. I feel very privileged today to share with you all a bit about our community Women's Savings Club. Next slide. This is the map of Solomon Island as shown in the features on my left. And that is where are located in the western part of the country on Kolobangara Island. Next slide. The Saving Club is part of the WWF Community-Based Fisheries Management Program, so it is really not a 
standalone microfinance project, but it is very much attached to the community-based fisheries management. The fish that are caught are sold primarily by the women in the local markets. Part of income gain from this is, is put into savings club for school fees, other family necessities, and also for rainy days. Apart from that, women also need to have savings to be able to apply for loans from the savings club, revolving funds. Normally women apply for loan to start other alternative income generating activities. Next slide. The business model underlying the savings club allows for women economic advancement and also empowerment. In terms of empowerment, the women have been able to earn their own income and most importantly, have been able to make their own decisions over how they use their money and how to make their own money, how to spend their own money, what to spend their money on. Next slide. WW help helps women in the community where we're working on community-based fisheries management to establish locally learned savings club, developing sustainability criteria, and facilitate trainings on a wide range of issues, including financial literacy, good governance and leadership, business planning and management, technical skills for alternate the livelihood. Next slide. Some of the micro enterprise that have been developed and supported by the Women's Savings Club include bakeries, as seen here, bakeries, screen printing, and dressmaking business. One lady dressed has become so popular that she now ship, shipping them to the capital Honiara to sell them water taxi services, guest houses, to name a few. Next slide. Our work is about long-term changes, but we already seen encouraging signs. These diversifications of income source suggest a reducing in the level of economic dependency on fishing among this community. Perfect competition still there as people produce and sell same type of product. Due to that, the sales of those homogeneous products lend to depend entirely on this quality at the market. Solomon Island government restrict movement of people so local sellers cannot sell their goods at the ma main market centered in Ringi. Fishing Gardening was mainly for household consumption, very low cash flow, so increased use of natural resources for household consumption, resulting in people eating healthy food from the gardens only and not in import goods from the shop. Women's market vendors experience scarcity of money due to impact of COVID restriction health concern, and social distance measure. Next slide. Members of Savings Club took up casual payment at the KFPL due to low cash flow at the markets. Savings Club suspended the savings scheme due to the pandemic situation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Rinda. And I'm sure we can talk a little bit more during the Q&A um, about the great work you're doing. This is such a great example that shows local resilience uh, can be built locally. So it's really an inspiring example. Thank you, Rinda. So far, I hope you're enjoying our virtual trip from Fiji to Malaysia to the Solomon Islands. Now we head over to Manila to hear from our fourth panelist, Anna Oposa, Executive Director of Save Philippine Sea. Good afternoon, Anna. 
Plastic pollution and waste management were key issues on the ocean's agenda before COVID-19 hit. And they are topics that your NGO is closely involved in. From what you are seeing in the Philippines, how has COVID-19 affected the problem and our ability to respond to it? Uh, also, it would be great if you could maybe share some of the insights on what you're seeing more generally in terms of the impacts on coastal resources and, and coastal communities currently. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Mabuhay. I'm Anna from the Philippines. And in the last year, we've seen how COVID-19 has really affected waste management. So there's the obvious one, which is the increase in medical waste. And a lot of countries like the Philippines don't have the necessary facilities and training to handle medical waste. And then there's all the disposable plastics that we've produced from food deliveries, from different shops switching to disposable items, e-commerce packaging. We always joke about how there's packaging inception when you receive like a big box and you open it and it's just layers of layers of bubble wrap and, and paper and then your item is this small. Um, and there's just this great fear of cross-contamination and, and, you know, lots of disposable PPEs, personal protective equipment. And during the strict lockdowns, the services for waste management, so that segregation, collection, um, recycling, were also very limited. So a lot of the waste that could have gone to, to these facilities ended up in the environment or in, in landfills. So in SPS, what we did was we worked with different organizations to create messages on how we can reuse in the best way possible. So we called it Plastics in the Pandemic, Fears versus Facts. And we also came up with a user's manual. And, you know, we revised this so many times because on the one hand, we wanted the science to be solid. So we wanted to make sure that everything is, you know, science-based and we're using the best available references. But on the other hand, we also have to be sensitive and meet people where they are because there are different comfort levels. And when the fear is imminent, you cannot force someone to stop using plastic. Um, and now we're trying to work out a partnership with one of the largest malls in the Philippines so that we can make these resources publicly available in a larger, um, with a larger audience. So it's been an exercise in patience and sensitivity and empathy, which are all skills that, you know, conservationists should have. When it comes to tourism, so SPS has been working in this marine protected area in, in the Philippines for sharks um, for nine years. And, you know, overnight, our community there lost their income. So my teammate and I have been talking on how we can support our stakeholders. And we decided to use the donations that we got from a 2019 fundraiser to install mooring buoys in this marine protected area network. So for months in the last part of 2020, we used those resources is to build these marine um, these mooring buoys, install them, and then get the team together from you, know, the boat crew, the dive operators, the dive guides who lost their income to work on this project. So it became a community building um, project. And we also brought in caterers because as you know, in the Philippines, um, we have to be well fed to be productive. And that provided not just income for, for the dive guides and the other people in that ecosystem, but also a long-term investment for infrastructure in this marine protected area network. So that kind of perspective and that kind of attitude where we tried our best to turn this um, situation into an opportunity for rebuilding and for blue recovery. That's it. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm sure there'll be questions pouring in during the discussion and of the Q&A. You know, I'm so humbled and inspired by how local coastal communities are contributing to protect our marine resources and finding solutions to new challenges such as COVID-19. I want to thank all the panelists for their interventions in the session above. So now let's bring in all the panelists for our panel discussion. We have two topics and uh, we will try to have all the panelists uh, take turns to answer our two questions. I hope all the panelists are ready and getting comfortable. So here is the first question. Thinking about the situations that uh, you are familiar with, are there practical steps that can be taken to support communities through rebuilding and a green recovery? Could you tell us what you think the top priorities 
it should be. And um, I know that uh, our colleagues in the islands might have some, some challenges with the technology. So allow me to maybe ask Rinda if she would like to just take the question first, since we have her connected. Rinda, would you would you like to answer the question or? Yeah, um, the pandemic situation here faced uh, a lot of um, pandemic situation here in um, my community where I come from. Um, the income is uh, very slow uh, due to um, sometimes we take our markets to our goods to the market and then uh, we just uh, sit there for almost a day because the cash flow is uh, very slow. People are not um, not uh, coming to buy our um, goods at the market so um, the cash money flow is uh, very slow. We find it very hard because uh, when we get the, um, the money, we can support uh, our family needs and also the school fees for our children. And also, uh, due to the COVID-19, um, the government is really, really uh, restricted for, the, for us to go out uh, doing our market, so we have to, when it allows us to go out and then we can go to do our market. And uh, the class flow for us is uh, very slow, not like when um, the COVID-19 is not uh, here, but now we find it very hard because uh, we cannot go out to um, do our to do our market. Thank you, Rinda, for sharing that. Um, I'd now like to invite any other um, panelists to share about what you think the top priorities should be in, in rebuilding and uh, in fostering a green recovery. Thank you, Natalie. Can I go now? Please, yes. Okay, um, and I'm starting from as we uh, as we are talking about coastal populations, and uh, I am I am considering um, public health and nutrition. So, and I'm starting from a, from 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 a point of view with where when we talk about improving food food security and nutrition, um, we use a concept of no one being left behind. And we know that these, we know that coastal populations, other poor and vulnerable populations, are suffering very much from these effects of COVID-19, as I explained, with respect to undernourishment, with respect to, to being hungry. And I do think that one of the responses we have with this crisis, and we've had it with all crises, but we've always, until now, looked at um, providing people with with food, keeping them from going hungry. I do think now, at this point, we can move from feeding to nourishing, and we can look at aquatic foods as being a superfood and look at the, the recovery at this immediate point of time for coastal populations and other poor and vulnerable groups. How do you get aquatic foods, aquatic food products within the rations and the procurement for the poor and vulnerable, for women and children, um, to many different schemes that, that development agencies have, NGOs, and certainly also governments. And we know that aquatic foods are superfoods, and if we would add them mm. to the package of um, of, of foods that we are now giving to to abate 
uh, the, the, the effects we are seeing on food and nutrition security. I really do think we can reach far. I can give examples that are being done, for example, in the state of Odishan in there, where dried fish products are being included mm. in feeding programs for young children and in take-home rations for um, mother and, uh, mothers and, uh, and, um, and adolescent girls. And I can also give, for example, an, an, an example from Cambodia, where the government of Cambodia is looking at fish products to be added to the packages that are given to for the treatment of malnourished children and also but well before but not now to, to school feeding children also in informal settings where they when school are now locked down that they can get nutritious foods. So my message is let's use some investments and development um, development uh, um, financing to move from feeding to nourishing and using aquatic foods as the superfood to get us there. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Shakuntala, that was a, a very strong message and I think we all heard it well. I never thought that dried fish could be a, a superfood. So uh, really, thanks for shedding light on that. Um, since we're talking about food, I recall that Ali Ferretti, you were talking about food resilience. So maybe you'd like to take on the question after this. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, I'd like to continue the, the theme that I started with, uh, or concluded with, that the resilience of food system is uh, key to ensuring food security uh, through crises such as uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, maybe I, if I can share that uh, one of the, uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 in Fiji uh, is, the, is, uh, is on tourism. And a lot, a lot of the, the workers um, who depend on uh, tourism suddenly uh, don't have a job. Um, and uh, from last year, until this year, we've seen a trend that people migrating back to the communities. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, we have uh, noticed, and probably a good news, is that uh, you know, a lot of um, those moving back to communities or relying on, on agriculture systems to support their family really uh, are using or utilizing some of the, I would say, the, the, the savings or the spillover from uh, uh, LMMAs and uh, uh, nature-based uh, efforts in the past, in the past uh, 20 years. So uh, essentially, what I would like to say that uh, uh, not only, not only uh, resilience of food systems is uh, important, but also the well-being of uh, the communities and the people um, um, are important. Uh, part of uh, and should be integrated as part of the building back, back uh, uh, building back better, um, ensuring that uh, uh, communities rely both on on um, agriculture as well as uh, uh, the coastal resources. Uh, one of the I think one of the important um, uh, aspects of uh, building back uh, uh, better or part of uh, building back better is uh, what we call uh, we uh, visioning, uh, allowing communities to be able to um, reflect, look back, and look ahead, and decide decide for themselves what is their desired future. Um, you know, with, with uh, COVID nineteen and looking ahead in two, um, 2030, what are some of the, the the things that they can do for themselves? And uh, providing this space is also necessary and important for communities to be able to. Um, uh, adjust as well as uh, uh, 
preparing or building back better. I'll, uh, I'll uh, stop uh, there, but uh, also to uh, add that uh, as part of the LMA uh, strategy, we are, we are calling a 100% solution. We are challenging the we are challenging some of the the status quo, uh, and uh, we firmly believe that a uh, healthy ocean, a uh, healthy and clean ocean for a desired future needs 100% management, uh, and not just uh, 30%. And uh, we believe that uh, we have learned enough lessons from our communities and uh, countries and uh, we can uh, rapidly scale up. Uh, that is uh, integrating uh, reef to reach land and sea management in communities, also be gender inclusive, be COVID-19 responsive, uh, some of the examples that I've shared, and be adaptive as well to climate uh, strategies, be disaster ready and uh, plastic free. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, part of uh, uh, looking ahead is being uh, wholly inclusive. Uh, this is the strategy that uh, we're calling uh, the 100% LMMA is 100% uh, solution. Uh, and in conclusion to uh, be able to ensure that the uh, resilience of the food systems is uh, paramount, uh, while at the same time being able to uh, adjust and build a build back a resilient uh, community. Oliferetti, for all those insights, I think we should probably transition to the second uh, question. Uh, and uh, on that note, let me read out the second question. So thinking more broadly about supporting community aspirations and promoting sustainable economic pathways, what are the things we need to be doing more of and what are the things we need to be doing less of? And again, uh, given the technological uh, limitations with the Solomon Islands, Rinda, I don't know if Salome is next to you. Would, would she like to take on uh, this question first from the Solomon Islands? Hi everyone, Hello. good evening. Okay, uh, the dis discussion on this question, what what are the things we need to do, be doing more of, and what do we need to be doing less of? So from our discussion here in the Solomon Islands, uh, the first uh, one is product effective en enforcement of community fisheries management plan rules to ensure there is for compliance. Uh, we understand here that if you heard about the Rinders uh, Marilson uh, presentation today, there is about 75 percentage of people living in the coastal areas that might entirely depend on the fisheries, uh, uh, fisheries resources for their livelihood and their income. Therefore, uh, we really need to conduct uh, effective enforcement for the communities in terms of the fisheries management and also compliance there so that they can manage well their um, uh, resources uh, that is part of the economic pathways and also those people living in the coastal areas they are entirely depend on the marine resources for the income as well as for the food and for the second point here is that uh, increase in um, agricultural activities um, uh, utilizing the land and the sea or some system uh, farming is another way of economic pathways here in the Solomon Islands as most of the people here in the uh, islands, they more rely on the gardenings or agricultural activities or production for their income. So um, we re just uh, really experienced that uh, the pandemic last year, it's really affected the people in the community when there is influx, influx of people coming down from the urban areas, sent us to the communities. When the communities, they have their own plan and when they have just two gardens or three gardens and uh, maybe two for income generation of uh, gardening and the other one is for household and when there is a lot of people in the household and they cannot uh, really um, 
really support their communities or the community peoples who are coming back from the urban areas. So there will be an increase in uh, agriculture for pathways or cultivating my lands for uh, farming so that uh, the community people can earn income so that they can support their families or, or so they can support their communities in a way in terms of development or in in a way that they increase development in the community so that the people in the community can access to whatever needs they want. And the third one is uh, that should be increased educa education to family members on financial budgeting this is encourage all members to have the habit of saving and spend money on priority needs. Um, we learn a lot from the women saving clubs when we do the financial inclusion uh, component part of the community-based fisheries management here in the Solomon with the community. We learn that when uh, the families, they learn more about how to do savings. When they learn that, then they can adapt and they can be resilient in times of like pandemics or any situation happen in the community or national wide or provincial wide, then they can be resilient. Uh, for, for examples is that uh, when working closely with the women here in the Solomon Islands with the communities, um, just uh, recently they testified that uh, the saving clubs which we work closely with them uh, really empower them through the trainings that they save money when there is pandemics. All these women, they highlighted that they already have some money that can be stand by for a lockdown. But that can stand by or support them for any priority needs during the hardship of any situation happen in country or at the community level. And what is to do less of? Uh, the first one here is spending money on unnecessary goods and services. Uh, there should be encourage people to do less savvy and they need to know more about what our priority needs only to spend money on. And the second one is unsustainable use of resources. As we here in the Solomon Islands, most of the community, they rely on the uh, on other natural resources for the uh, livelihood. So there should be a sustainable use of resources and there should be policies that should be supported the community as a uh, the country as well in a way that how people to uh, enforce, how people to compliance with the policy so that they can use the resources wisely. And the last point here is to do less of is non-compliance to fisheries management rules because there are a lot of people uh, we understand that in the community they need to know more about what is compliance is and what is enforcement uh, and they need to know the rules and regulation of the management uh, areas so that they can compliance and they can enforce rules at the community levels. I think that's all from here in the Solomon Islands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rinda and Salome from the Solomon Islands. We have only a short uh, few minutes left, but I'd like to ask Anna maybe to share her thoughts on what to do more and what to do less. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Natalie. So what I think people and governments and private sector should do more of, and I'm looking at this from the sustainable tourism perspective. So what we can do more of is promote slow tourism. And what we can do less of is to promote the kind of tourism that's always pushing for for faster, bigger um growth. So when we talk about slow tourism, it's like limiting the number of people in, in a site. So in the Philippines, for example, Boracay Island, which is a popular beach destination, and Oslob in Cebu, which is popular for its whale shark interaction tourism. Um, it's been under a lot of environmental pressure because of the thousands and thousands of people going there every day. And for the longest time, the government would say that they're not able to limit the people going. And with the uh, it took a pandemic for them to realize that they could. And this type of tourism, instead of the harder, bigger, faster type, it's more of a slower and closer type. And this kind of tourism is not only good for the tourist itself, because then you have a better user experience. Um, you know, there aren't like thousands of people elbowing you in the ocean or when you're sunbathing in the beach, but also it's less pressure in the environment. So then it's a win-win situation for both the tourists, the environment, and the tourist operators because their tourists are also happier and the whale sharks are happier and we'll thank them in the future. 
<laughs> Thank you, Anna. I love it when you say, and the whale sharks will be happier. Uh, puts a smile in my heart and my face, I guess. Okay, I know that um, we've heard so much from all of the four panelists, and I think it's, it's time now, the, the audience are probably itching to ask some questions. So it's time now we, we switch to our um, Q&A session. So I hope panelists, you are ready. Um, I will be receiving questions that the audience has sent us uh, by my uh, magic moderator screen. Um, and I will be uh, calling out the questions. Um, let's give uh, a few seconds so that the panelists uh, can get themselves ready while I read the first question. Okay. Looks like the panelists are getting comfortable and ready. I see the first question, and the first question um, is probably uh, more for our colleagues from uh, the banks. Uh, and maybe we could start with Christian first. Uh, so the question is, what do you think will be the role of blended finance into bridging the gap between investors and impactful projects in Asia? Anything that EIB is working on on this front. And also, uh, Ingrid, when, when you answer after, Christian, you can mention about the AD. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. And do you hear me? Yes, I hear you perfectly. Yeah, very, very, very good. Um, I, it's a good question because certainly uh, uh, often many projects within this this area will not only what not on in itself be economically viable, and and, and, and often uh, there will be a need to to uh, complement loans with grants uh, and from others from other sources also. And that is what we also are going to work together with the Asian Development Bank on in in within this memorandum of understanding that we talked about before. I think the EU will will, will be a source of this of our plans to make uh, to make to make the projects that we finance together more more resilient and more uh, sustainable in, in economic terms uh, and this is part of our setup that uh, next to also technical advice uh, that we would we would try to bring on board grants for the project so to blend them with the, with the loans that we provide thank you Natalie. yes thank you Christian Ingrid, would you like to maybe uh, take a stab at that question, please? Yes, I, I first of all want to, want, to, uh, want to thank the person who asked the question for this very pertinent, uh, for bringing up this very pertinent subject. Um, we believe that blended finance, for the reason that Christian mentioned, is actually crucial in, in providing more money, more funding um, for healthy oceans and the blue economy. The reason it's crucial, because there are two types of projects. On the one hand, the projects who are financially viable, which can be banked or made bankable quite easily uh, and will be picked up by the financial sector. Then there are the other projects that deal with avoided costs for the future, an investment that needs to be made today to avoid bigger disasters or impact for disasters or carbon release or loss of diversity in the longer run. Now, this group of projects still needs to be financed to make, to make sure in the future we can use the ecosystem services, but it's not as easy. So there we need to find a group of stakeholders that come together, that have access to different types of capital, patient capital, capitals requiring less returns that can take certain risks out of these transactions. And once projects are de-risks by using several types of finance, they can be partially financed by the private sector, but never fully. Thank you, Ingrid. I think that was very helpful for those who do not come from a finance background. So people probably can now uh, really understand what blended finance implies for going ahead with our healthy oceans. Um, let me now jump to the next uh, question. This question is, how important are informal sectors in fisheries and waste management 
and how important is it to work with them? So let me repeat in case you didn't get it. How important are informal sectors in fisheries and waste management? And how important is it to work with them? So can I ask for a volunteer among the panelists who'd like to tackle the question on informal sector, which is a very important sector in a lot of economies in this region? I can talk about the informal sector in the waste management industry. So in uh, the waste management industry, there's a huge informal sector. They're the informal waste pickers. Um, you know, they scavenge to pick up waste in the, in the landfills and then sell it to junk shops. And they are crucial and necessary in keeping the circular economy and waste management services um, going. And it's important because, one, because they're part of it, but also, two, because they're people. And we, we don't really think about that so much because we don't, give them the basic services that they need. So there's this group in, in the Philippines called the Mother Earth Foundation, and they've been working with, and, and Gaia, and they've been working with the informal waste sector. And I'm so impressed with their work because they not only provide um, PPEs for the waste pickers, because if we think about it, they're also frontliners, right? They're the ones that are keeping the waste from us. And we don't even know what, what kind of waste they're picking um, when they get dumped after we throw it away. So they not only provide um, BPEs, but they also provide um, vitamins and other supplements for their waste pickers. And now the discussion is always to make sure that they have the basic um, services like health, education for their children, hazard bay. Um, so these are things that we need to consider when we work with them. And really, when in any waste management project, they need to be considered as stakeholders that are equivalent or maybe even more important mm -hmm. than corporations and, and NGOs and other civil society organizations. They deserve a seat at the table. Thank you, Anna, for raising that voice on, on the informal sector. I'd like to also maybe invite Dr. Sarkuntula to say a little bit about the informal sector, since you talked a lot about the importance of vulnerable populations, especially coastal communities and, and communal fisheries, which is probably a part of the informal sector. So maybe just a few words on your thoughts. Thank you. And we do know that if we, if we will keep to the coastal populations, we do that many. Co we do know that many coastal populations, especially women, use the resources from from coastal fisheries for food and nutrition for themselves and their families, but as well as a means of livelihoods for their families. So. What I do think is important, and I have said this before, is that when we put into when we take into consideration the, the policies and the governance systems that we are putting in place, that they do reflect the voices, the aspirations, and the solutions that coastal populations see for themselves. They are very often not listened to, not heard, and ignored. So we have to put structures in place whereby whatever we do, be it short term or long term, now with recovery to COVID-19, but in general for management and for sustainability, that we have structures that make sure that these voices, aspirations, and solutions are part of the equation. Thank you, Shakuntala. The next question, uh, we're getting a lot of questions. So I'm just going to roll by. The next question uh, can be answered by all the panelists, but I think this is especially relevant for Ingrid and, and Christian. The question is as follows. How do we ensure programs from international financial institutions like the EIB, like the ADB, empower communities at the local level? So it probably links nicely to what Shakuntala and Anna had said about giving uh, people place uh, at the table. Over to you both, Ingrid and Christian. I will go first. Great. Now, gr again, fabulous question. Um, what we are doing, we are already working very closely um, with NGOs and civil society to get their voice heard in our, for example, in our strategies, 
and in our policies. But not only at a corporate level, we also work with these organizations at the project level to make sure their voices are heard, the voices of the local communities when we talk about environmental impact, resettlement um, on a project by project basis. What we are enhancing is the voice of the people in, in, in setting the strategy of working with a country. Now, apart from that, um, and that, that brings me partially back to, um, to the responsibilities of subnational governments, of the responsibilities of localizing the SDGs, because they cannot be localized without the support and the ingenuity and the power, as we've seen and heard today from the stories, of the people who are actually most affected by these SDGs. So it's important in that respect, I think, to build the capacity of those local units and of those local communities. And this building of capacity, we're trying to enable. But how we do it, I get to that next. But let me first share with you what kind of enabling and strengthening of the capacity we can think about. So it's about strengthening and building an enabling ecosystem for local entrepreneurs. That can be done by enhancing their expertise and knowledge through knowledge and expertise transfers. One thing we've heard today that came up a couple of times is a lack, but still the importance of financial literacy. Mm -hmm. The other one is, uh, is for example, um, sharpening the knowledge of technologies available when a certain business plan has been conceived. And last but not least, there was, um, there was talk about access to affordable finance. And this mm. piece of access to affordable finance, to make the link to the local community, we need a business plan that's written by somebody from the financial sector, by a business person who knows how to do this. Now, this knowledge is often not available at the local community level. But this can be brought there by interaction through technical assistance. So what we have been doing as ADB, we've been working with countries, regions and provinces to set up financial funds with multi-stakeholders. And the, the multi-stakeholders could be the local business, it could be an EIB, an AIB, but it's also local funding from the government and maybe the local government to get buy-in from most stakeholders and to be enabled to provide funding that is, again, more patient, lower rate, concessional, but it could also be, apart from loans, equity, to foster these communities in building the business plans and financing them, but also with grants for technical assistance to build and enhance the technical capacity at the local community level. I leave it there and hand over to Christian. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, I also think it's, it's, it's a very relevant, very relevant question, and, and uh, but I uh, also think that the English English uh, the answer is, is really relevant and, and good. May I just may I just uh, compliment with that. I think we are on a we are on a journey here. Uh, these elements that sort of engaging also with communities and and, and, and NGOs when when we do. Uh, projects or are engaged in projects that are relevant to to, to uh, at community level. Uh, we're doing that more and more. It is becoming embedded within this overall ESG uh, uh, policies. And even if we are not we are not at at the end yet of this process, I think we are coming. Uh, uh, we've come come a, come a long way in this in in, in sort of making sure that that. That projects are not only economically or financially viable, but that they also, in the longer term, that they're actually sustainable and also uh, regarding the communities they, should, they, they are part of. And, and, uh, and that is also part of being economically viable. viable. Thank you. Thank you, both Ingrid and, and Christian. We've learned so much uh, in just with short amounts of time. 
Uh, thank you for simplifying finance for those who are non-finance specialists in this room. Um, speaking of community engagement, let's just remain on that note. And maybe I'd like to ask uh, Alu Ferretti and Anna how they think communities should be engaged in the design and in the rollout of plans. And how do you think um, to, we could get uh, perspectives from local CSOs? Over to you both. I can I can start. Um, so I'm kind of in a unique position because I am both leading a grassroots organization, but I've also had the opportunity to work in the Asian Development Bank and in the Oceans programs of the Asian Development Bank. So I have a, a very different perspective that sees both sides. And I think ADB in the last few years has really worked on getting a meaningful stakeholder engagement. And, you know, we have to make sure that um, we include gender and, you know, there's this big gender equality and social inclusion component in integrated in every project. But what I hope is that it doesn't remain as a box ticking exercise because we are required to report, you know, who we engaged with. But it's engagement isn't just about asking us you know, from the grassroots point of view, how a project can be improved or what would be good. It's including us in the implementation and the monitoring and evaluation. So when it comes to implementation, I want to throw back the question to ADB and, and ask how does it become meaningful for them? Um, you know, it, when it comes to implementation, it's including the voices of the people in the design and making sure that the capacity is being built, not just in terms of in terms of including them in a workshop because that's just performative, right? How do we make that kind of change, behavior change, institutional change, and really something that sustains for even when the project is done? All right. Um, I think, thank you, Anna. I think we've lost Ali Ferretti. So, I mean, Rinda or Shakuntala, maybe you'd like to share uh, your thoughts on how we can oh you're back Ali Ferretti. great 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 um so we'll have Ali Ferretti go and if, if you guys want to chime in but first Ali Ferretti. hey just to just to add on to uh anna uh firstly that um that um it's, it's important to engage communities more intentionally than, uh, than, than as, a, as a tokenistic. Um, by that, I mean, uh, it's, so, it's easy to, for efficiency sake, and also during these uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions, it's easy to uh, overlook or to cut corners uh, and, and bypass community engagement. Uh, I would like to introduce that uh, free and prior informed consent is very uh, critical uh, as part of engaging uh, communities in uh, ensuring that they are uh, part of the design uh, as well as in the, the implementation. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, NGOs, especially for the Pacific that, uh, that uh, have very good working relationships with um, with communities. Uh, they can be either a conduit to uh, communities and uh, and vice versa. Uh, but um, uh, I mean, uh, along the way, uh, in a, in our experience, we have built uh, an army of uh, of uh, community champions who have gained enough experience and technical. Uh, expertise to be able to be to be part of these um, uh, discussions. Uh, the reason it is uh, they are important is one healthy ocean means a lot to them. It is part of their survival and uh, part of their uh, resilience. Uh, and uh, healthy and clean ocean uh, is also their business, and uh, they are the first. Uh, also to be uh, impacted if uh, there is a, a crisis uh, in the ocean and uh, and uh, it it only 
it's logical and it makes sense to involve them uh, more intensively. Thank you. All right. Actually, may, um, may I say one small sentence? Sure, here? sure. Uh, please be quick. Please be quick. The, I know yeah. the Q and A went went so fast, yeah. but please be quick. Shakuntala. Yeah. It's about it's about um, investments in the granularity of the data we have. I do think that some uh, uh, organization like the Asian Development Bank can invest more in having granularity of data at subnational level um, that takes into consideration community community level data that's disaggregated for example of course sex disaggregated but also age distribute age disaggregated and community disaggregated and if we have that then we can then we can put much more efforts into getting solutions that are context specific for these populations Thank you, Dr. Shakuntala. And uh, we are really good on time. Uh, time is up uh, for the Q&A. And you know, I was surprised how fast time went by. Uh, I didn't realize that we had already spent the 20 minutes, but for me, it felt like we only spoke in a very short period of time. So we are now entering into the final section of the event. And I would like to invite Ingrid and Christian back to share their reflections based on what was discussed today. And I will invite Christian to share his thoughts with us. So Christian, from the discussion we have had today, would you like to reflect uh, any of the key opportunities in the Asia Pacific region? And what will you be taking away from this session? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. I think, first of all, I would like to, to stress that I sort of you become ever more convinced that we have to find a way forward, combining recovery and economic growth and job creation on, on, on one hand, and on the other. And that's also from an economic uh, reason for the quality of life, for the livelihoods of the many persons impacted by the health of the oceans. We have to uh, continue combine economic growth with the sustainable and trajectory in, 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 in doing this. this uh, become ever more more sort of uh, clear. This recently signed uh, uh, memorandum of an understanding between the Asian Development Bank and the European Investment Bank for the Clean and Sustainable Ocean Partnership. I think it provides a good basis to jointly explore how the two institutions can support Asian countries in, in, a in achieving these objectives. And when it comes to using COVID-19 recovery-related investment, to ensure a more sustainable, inclusive, resilient post-pandemic post economy, we see the need to not only build back greener across the blue economy. Attention might also be given to the waste and plastic impact of the COVID-19 epidemic, where face masks and gloves contribute to the plastic problems in Asia. After we've entered into this uh, agreement in, in, in January between the two banks, our experts from, 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 both, from both banks within the different target sectors and that are plastics, uh, bioeconomy, coastal resilience, and green shipping, we begun to identify potential projects for cooperation. We're also discussing how to set up technical assistance programs and how to secure access to grants to blend them with the loans that, that we provide from the banks. Uh, as, as we also talked about before, Often projects will only be economically viable with both loans and grants, and where the banks can provide the loans, grants could uh, come from uh, public uh, donors uh, worldwide, and, and, and for us it's particularly relevant to talk to the EU. Um, well, all, uh, I think we, we need to respond more effectively and efficiently to the large infrastructure needs that follow population and, and economic growth and, and quick urbanization. It will involve flexible design that it ensures resilience to climate change, built with recycled or renewable materials, and promote sharing solutions during the use phase. As we've heard today, uh, uh, projects or, or, or developments will only be, be sustainable in, in many respects if, if it's if it includes, involves communities, engage with, with, with people who are actually part of the projects and, and it uh, targets it what actually is needed uh, locally. 
And we need to stay clear of projects that are more politically motivated than responding to actual real needs. And I think the investment required during the coming decades is so huge that one should avoid spending resources that would take us away from a sustainable, resilient trajectory. We should build forward, not backwards. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Christian. Ingrid, now I'd like to um, invite you to share your reflections. So how do you think the partnership approach of ADB and EIB with uh, CSOs can be strengthened to enhance the impact of your Healthy Oceans initiative? Thank you, Natalie. I would first like to to start by thanking the, the panelists for being so open. I, I just found it a very humbling, but also equally encouraging and inspiring to listen to your stories. And, and coming back to the remarks just made, I think we completely agree um, that, that multi-stakeholder dialogue is important and not just a token exercise. We don't have time for just token exercises. And, and people are listened to. I don't think it is an exercise at the moment. And there is room for credible inclusion. And now I will go to the question that Natalie asked, because that's very much reflected in there. We have to keep in mind that, like anything, it's a journey. And development banking, doing the development projects, the way we do it, has been evolving the last decade. What we do now as a bank, after having celebrated our 50th anniversary and how we do it, is very different than when we did it 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we're learning on the way by doing very strict project evaluations and picking up on the learning points and the things we left on the side. So I think that's, that's a remark I want to make. And reflecting on that, historically, um, CSOs have been involved, and I think it, it, it was kind of a first that it has been deeply involved in the setting of our strategy. Our strategy 2030 that was set um, in 2019. So I think that that was an important step. In addition, um, it is actually, it was involved in our safeguard policy, and it's currently involved in the date of our energy policy two policies that deeply involve the local communities and deeply involve the knowledge and experience of the CSO to guide us there. Now, on the project level, a long history of, of cooperation with various parties on areas I, I already indicated, such as, for example, resettlement and environmental impact. Now, build on those, build on those experiences we are now expanding our cooperation on an internal level, on a very important level. It's the level where we write and develop the, the country strategy partnerships. These are planned three to five years where we agree with the government what we're going to do and how and what we're going to invest in. And in the second area, um, it's on the implementation level. There will be enhanced cooperation envisaged with working with CSOs. At the moment, we start working with governments on the implementation and development of new policies and regulations. I think in the development area, we are very much aware of issues mentioned before, like informal workforce, informal networks, which often tap into vulnerable communities. We've learned in the water sector and also the waste sector that was quite nicely brought up by Anna, um, that success is very limited, even if the policies and regulations are in place, when we forget or ignore some of the stakeholders. And the current participants in a certain industry segment are stakeholders, even if they're illegal or or in another umbrella. They are stakeholders and they should be involved. And I think that's part of the journey that organizations and development work has made, that in the future these parties are involved. And as we all know, with, with full stakeholder involvement, the chances of success and progress are much enlarged. 
I'll leave it there, Natalie. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. And thank you both, Christian and Ingrid. I have one last kind of question to maybe share that departing message or the departing insight. So maybe I'll ask Christian first. Is there one key insight that you are taking away from this session? It should be that, that I've actually been very much encouraged by what we've heard here today uh, from, from the other panelists and, and from, the, from the audience. Uh, it's, it's, it's encouraging to, 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 to learn or, or to experience the engagement of enthusiasm within this, within this area. I think all the, the panelists, Ali Florezza, Jean Cotula, Winter, and Anna Raposa, uh, it was extremely interesting and, and, and it brought a, a sort of community level uh, angle to, to this. This is very important. Um, we at the European Investment Bank, and I'm sure that goes for the Asian Development Bank also, we look very really much forward to increase our work on these issues. And, and, and thank you, thank you to, the, to the Asian Development Bank and the World Wildlife Fund for, for hosting this. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And very quickly, Ingrid, if you have a one quick insight you want to share as really closing the se the session. Yes, I, I think I think um, the grassroots enterprise and the initiatives they've shown us yet again the virtual the value of a virtual cycle of progress fueled by empowerment and enthusiasm and where it can bring us. I think it's extremely powerful and positive. Thank you, Ingrid. And, and for me, you know, what I really drew out from this event um, and being inspired by everyone, both of you and our four panelists is really what Ingrid mentioned before is the quality of partnerships. And I, I think this side event with all your participation is maybe the signal that we are beginning, we are setting tone for a really high quality partnership. So that's what I have taken away and very humbled by that. Now, this is the end of our event. And I really want to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to all our panelists, to all our guest speakers and to you all who have joined. With the very few minutes remaining together, I invite those of you who can stay on to just relax and take a field visit with us to the Solomon Islands. We will show a short video of the Solomon Islands work. Thank you. When I was a little girl, my mother always do weaving. That's our job, that's our work. And now we do business about the baskets. You know, this place is an island. We, we have not got any gardens and just only we find fees to sell them in the markets and weaving baskets. Though our culture is that men is the head of the family, but now we see that women are very active and they do a lot of things and they make sure that food is on the table. And now what I experience is that most of the people, they more depend on the cows. And they, most of the people, they depend on the food from the shops. As well as the big challenge is that looking for money to pay for school fees. Every year here in the Solomon Islands, the school fees increases. Those women have a lot of children they find it hard. All these products I can make my family for my living and for my school fee. And now my daughter is uh, make three years in Vanuatu just only for these things. I pay up the school fees. We like to see more women to be empowered. Yeah? When we get our money a day we can sort out where to, to put our money on. 
And this one him helps us not to just take the money and dump him inside the water stores. That's no good. I see that this uh, project, when it's best for the women, it's really educate women as well as it's really empowered women. And women now are there, they learn a lot and they empowered and they say, oh, we can uh, be in the meeting, we can make decisions. And most of the women express that now we understand that to save money, we can meet our future needs. measuring board uh, to see sizes sizes of fish and after we measuring fish sizes and identify which species this fish maybe it, this fish mature or not mature after then we use a data sheet to collect data then we send to office and they, we try to identify which fish is plenty and which fish may be going down protect our fish. We really happy because some community see what we doing and they do learn from us. So we really happy because our reef is well protected.